It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to take you through three parts uh, in the talk. I'll give you the story of cancer and try to uh, explain why evolution is really at the center of it, and then talk about how we can use evolution both to treat cancer and to prevent cancer. Um, but first, I thought we'd talk about me, one of my favorite topics. Um, but really, by way to give you uh, some background, actually, I started off in a, a double major in psychology and computer science at Oberlin, and I thought I was going to go into artificial intelligence. And then in junior year, I stumbled across this idea of evolution as an algorithm. Um, and so to give you that really briefly, a lot of people in the room probably have seen this kind of stuff before in this field called genetic algorithms and evolutionary programming. Um, but evolution is a kind of algorithm. You generate a bunch of possible solutions to your problem. Uh, they have some scoring, which we think of as, uh, we call the fitness function in, the, in uh, genetic algorithms. You throw away the worst solutions, you make the better solutions, have sex, mutate them, and try it again, and you, and you get solutions to your problems. And so it, it struck me that evolution is the only algorithm that's ever produced intelligence. So uh, my interest in artificial intelligence veered towards evolution. Um, and I went off to Oxford to work with W.D. Hamilton uh, for my master's degree um, in this field of artificial life, which is uh, analogous to artificial intelligence, um, and did some projects in evolution of disease. Um, I then went back to MIT for a PhD in computer science. It was a little bit weird to hear cancer talk from computer scientists, but uh, there you have it. Um, and did a dissertation on this question of why do we have so many species? What, what was the cause of diversification? Which had basically zero impact. I've driven everybody off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> no, they can't see the, the slides from there. Um, so uh, after the, the PhD that had zero impact, I decided I really want to get back into do the evolution of disease because I found that really fulfilling. And then the question was, what was the right disease to work on? So I went to work with Stephanie Forrest at University of New Mexico, not really knowing what disease to work on. And we spent a semester looking around. You know, HIV was too crowded, looking for some field where, where there really wasn't much work, but we could make an impact. And stumbled across this um, description in this book, Commotion in the Blood, which is about um, immune therapy and cancer, that cancer is an evolutionary process, a, a disease of evolution among the cells. And I had never heard of that before, so I went to PubMed and asked for all, for all uh, articles with evolution and cancer in the title, and I got approximately six hits back to 1966. And I was just floored by this. I mean, there's basically nothing written on it. Um, and so that brings me to the story of cancer and why you should be floored by that. And in fact, I'll come back to that and actually quantify a little bit better the, the uh, degree of evolution, evolutionary biology in cancer biology. So that brings me to the story of cancer. And this really, uh, people started getting hints of this back in the 1950s and 60s when they had cytologists looking at chromosome banding patterns, identifying chromosomes in people with blood cancers and start, starting to see um, these, these problems in the chromosomes. A piece of this chromosome 9 had broken off and connected with a piece of chromosome 22 in this chronic myeloid leukemia, which is called the Philadelphia chromosome because it was discovered in Philadelphia. And so they saw that there's association with cancer and the, and the genes and the chromosomes. This is an example of the lamppost problem. You only sort of understand things when you can look underneath the lamppost. This is an old story about the drunk walking home looking for his keys. He's lost his keys and he's only looking under the lamppost. And the police officer asks him why and says, well, that's where the light is, right? And so we can only, in science, we only see the things that we have you know, uh, tools to see with. So the cytology revealed this, and what was particularly striking is if you look at the same patient over time, you saw not only the original abnormality in chromosomes 9 and 22, but accumulation of extra chromosomes and things got just progressively worse. And so watching these uh, leukemia and lymphoma patients, we are able to start seeing this dynamic of accumulation of genetic changes, and huh, that starts sounding a lot like evolution. So, Peter Knoll in 1976 published this paper in Science where he laid out the evolutionary theory of cancer that is an accumulation of, of mutations over time that eventually leads to both malignancy and drug resistance. And you'll notice a number of parallels that really match what Andrew was talking about in the last talk with infectious disease. <clears throat> so this is probably the most important slide in this talk. This is the heart of understanding cancer, which is that it's driven by natural selection. So you get natural selection any time you have the following three necessary and sufficient conditions. There must be variation in the population. So you get this from these changes in the DNA and the cells that we just accumulate during our life, so somatic uh, changes. The variation has to be heritable, so parents have to be like children. In this case, when a cell divides, it, of course, passes on any mutations in its DNA to the, the daughter cells. And that variation has to affect fitness, that is, reproduction or survival. And you see this in cancer. Cells, for instance, suppress apoptosis, suppress these, uh, these programmed cell death or cell suicide so that they have a survival advantage over the normal cells that are committing suicide when they ought to be. And in fact, if you look at the hallmarks of cancer, these are the common characteristics or phenotypes of cancer across all different cancers. If you look at each of these hallmarks, these are 
phenotypes are characteristics that give an advantage to the mutant that acquires that phenotype over the competitor cells that don't have that phenotype. So for example, cancers typically, uh, they ignore signals that would normally suppress the growth of cells in our bodies, right? So now they have a reproductive advantage. They generate their own signals to proliferate, so now they've added an another reproductive advantage. As I said, they suppress this programmed cell death or apoptosis. They stabilize their telomeres, which allows them to divide indefinitely, whereas most cells age over time by er eroding their telomeres. They generate new blood vessels. You can go down the whole list of behaviors you see across cancers, and these are all selectively advantageous for the cell. Obviously not selectively advantageous for the host, right? This is gonna kill us, and so it's not great for the host, but this is an example of uh, multi-level selection, so selection at the cells is, is different than the selection at the organism. And for um, some people in the audience might be interested that these behaviors are not being evolved from whole cloth. These are just normal behaviors in cells that are normally active in other parts of our life cycle during embryogenesis, during wound healing, for instance, generation of new blood vessels. And so the cancer, all it has to do is reactivate these things. It doesn't have to make them up. It either reactivates things or it just rips out uh, parts of the wiring of the cell. So you don't have to take my word for all this. There is variation in neoplasm. Any way you choose to look at a neoplasm, here's a list of all different ways of, uh, of lampposts, really, if we're seeing, looking inside a tumor, you'll find different mutant cells within the same tumor. And the signature of natural selection in cancer is called clonal expansions. A clone is a set of cells that all derive from an ancestral cell that has some characteristic mutation. So you can see like patches of skin that all have a mutation in the gene P53 that's been stained on a mouse skin. And in fact, across all different uh, organs, you'll see these, this signature of natural selection happening in our bodies. So the, the major consequences of this somatic evolution, this, somatic, this evolution among our cells and our bodies over, is really twofold. It drives the process of neoplastic progression, that's the fancy term for carcinogenesis or the change from normal cells to malignancy. It also drives uh, the, the, our problems with therapy. So, Actually, this is a cartoon that's, that's useful to think about, and you'll see it in a variety of evolutionary contexts, but the idea is that we think that progression happens through a series of mutations, that mutant clone is spreads through the population, expands, and then there's another wave of expansion of series of, of selectively uh, uh, advantageous clones that sometimes, if you're unlucky, will end in cancer. Now, the problem with therapy, of course, is we come in, just like with antibiotics, we come in with a huge artificial selection pressure, and we select for any mutant cells that are all resistant in the tumor already, and then the tumor grows back and the patient relapses, and now you can't use that same drug again. It won't, the tumor won't respond. So that's the basic exp uh, explanation for why we haven't been able to cure cancer. It's pure and simple, just evolution. Now, I wanted to... Uh, to, for some people that aren't familiar with the clinical trial process, the way we develop these drugs, there's uh, important lessons here. One is the, this, this phase one. The very first thing we do is we ramp up the dose to find the best dose. And that depends on this um, dose response curve. That is, when you have too little drug, you get no response. At some point, you get a hit sweet spot where you're starting to get a response, usually in this case, killing the tumor. And at some point, you get so much drug that you get diminishing returns. So this is typical of, of pretty much any drug. And so the way we try to treat cancer is we try to get as far up this curve as possible to kill as many cells as possible. Now, most cancer drugs just kill all proliferating cells in your body. So not just the tumor cells, but also your normal cells. So if you go too far up this curve, you also kill the patient. So you're going up, you're dosing and increasing the dose until the point where you kill more patients from your drug than are being killed by the cancers. And then you back off slightly. So this is why chemotherapies are so toxic, because we're basically trying to kill the patient or get as close to killing the patient as possible. Um, but, uh, but in order to get the most uh, um, effect, therapeutic effect. Now also notice that the next thing that happens is the, the phase two clinical trial, once you've settled on a dose, is to just to see if you get any hint of effectiveness. And now the, the hint of effective, effectiveness is here shrinking the tumor. It's not survival of the patient. And we're gonna come back to that because that's a critical mismatch in what we're doing. And then we go on to phase three clinical trials which typically do look at survival and we find a lot of the phase two uh, drugs fail in phase three. So in the end, a home run in the field of cancer is extending life by a matter of months. I mean, that's considered a huge success. And frankly, that's pathetic. So evolution is really at the heart of cancer biology. It explains why we get cancer. It explains why we haven't been able to cure it. But why aren't we using evolution? And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about backing up the statement that we aren't using evolution in cancer biology. There's less than 10 evolutionary biologists across the world in cancer centers that I know of, and I know most of them. Uh, I should say, I know most of the people working on evolution and cancer. Um, we don't train our doctors in evolution, obviously. That's one of the, the, the main messages of this and the reasons for this, this conference. Um, 
And it seemed like it just wasn't being used in research either. And that was sort of my, my experience from reading the research. But I teamed up with Athena Actippus, who will be speaking after me, to actually quantify that. And so we did a literature analysis of therapeutic resistance, this really obvious case of, of evolution in cancer. And we looked for abstracts in the PubMed database, database for using any kind of evolutionary term, natural selection, clonal expansion, blah, blah, blah. Um, and what you see here is that it's been pretty stable since about 1983, when the first terms showed up, that about 1% of papers on therapeutic resistance in cancer use some kind of evolutionary term in the abstract. Now, if you delve into those papers, which we did on a smaller number of papers, and actually read them through and analyze how they're doing things, 10% of them actually have some kind of evolutionary theory behind uh, understanding their, their problem. What's really dismaying here for me uh, as a medical researcher is that, of, that six of the 22 papers had absolutely no hypothesis, no explanation, no theory whatsoever for what they're observing. Eleven of the pa papers described what they're observing as, or the, their, their hypothesis was, well, some people responded to the drug and some people didn't, which is just a restating of what they observed and is not a theory for why that is so. So how can we make progress in medicine if you don't have a theory, a hypothesis to test, a way, something to invalidate, or something to, to, uh, to frame your next question. So it's striking to me also that, that evolutionary theory is actually the dominant theory in cancer. Right? It is accepted. It's, it's taught uh, in, I think, a somewhat superficial way, but it is taught in medical school. Um, I don't get pushback when I go to, me to national conferences. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's just not controversial, per se. It survived 36 years of testing. Um, but even in the most obvious case of this, it's actually not being used. So why is that? Well, Athena is actually leading a project to ask, why isn't it being used? Um, and I don't think she's actually going to talk about that in her next talk, but you can ask her about it. And the other critical point here is that virtually nobody dies of chemosensitive disease. We actually don't have a big problem in finding drugs that kill cancer cells. What we have a big problem is in finding drugs that actually extend life because they select for, for resistance, and then the patient dies from uh, resistance, the resistant disease. So this is actually a huge opportunity for us to understand resistance, prevent it, and treat it. And I'll come back to that. So here we go, treating, uh, treating the cancer with, uh, using evolutionary principles. Well, we actually have a proven example of how this can work. You can figure out the mechanism of resistance. What is the drug selecting for? And then you can design a drug that works on the resistant disease to your first drug. So this is uh, Gleevec and chronic myeloid leukemia. It selects for mutations in the BCR able uh, oncogene um, that, that prevent the drug from binding to, that, to the uh, cancer cells. And, you can, and people designed the satinib uh, and another drug that still work on that Gleevec resistant disease. So it can work if you, if you actually look at what your drugs are selecting for and then go after that resistant disease. So we're taking this strategy into acute myeloid leukemia, which is a much more deadly disease. We're doing the genomics of the samples pre-therapy and when the patients relapse to understand what are the selective effects of our therapy and how can we address them. This, I put this slide in here because I think this is the most important advance in cancer therapy. Unfortunately, it's not my paper. Um, but it's the paper by Bob Gatenby down at Moffitt Cancer Center. Um, and it's a paper entitled Adaptive Therapy. Um, and the idea behind adaptive therapy is not to kill the tumor. So this is, this is echoing some of what Andrew is talking about. Not to kill the tumor, but let's just keep the tumor stable. Let's see if we can keep people alive. Rather, the, the, the goal should be keeping people alive, not removing the tumor, per se, if those things are in opposition, and I think they are. So the idea here is just to adjust the dose of drug you're, you're giving to keep the tumor the same size. So the algorithm goes, start with high dose to try to get the tumor under control, then check the tumor every three days. If it, if it doesn't grow, don't do anything. If it does grow, then look at the previous time you checked. If it also had grown then, then your dosage is too small and you have to ramp up your dose. If it hadn't grown the the previous, in the previous time you checked, then your dose is doing just fine and you can try ramping down the dose. You reduce the dose. So this is the data. This, he did this experiment twice with ovarian cancer cells injected into immune-compromised mice. This is a very aggressive uh, cell line. Um, the upper curve is when you don't do any kind of treatment. The next curve is when you do a standard high-dose treatment, so you knock the tumor back, but resistant cells grow, and it comes back, grows back. And then this lower curve is adaptive therapy. And they actually could kept, keep the, live, the mouse alive indefinitely. They eventually had to sacrifice the mice because they were getting too old. And note that this is not a new drug. This is actually carboplatin, one of the major cancer therapy drugs that's been around. It can be used on any possible drug. It's only been done this once on mice with this one cell line, so we, don't, we can't take it to the bank yet. And um, so I... I convinced Bob to put in a grant to try this in all the different uh, major breast cancer uh, drugs, and we're waiting to see if we're going to get funded on that. 
So there's things we can do to treat cancer with using evolutionary theory. There's also things we can do to prevent cancer. <clears throat> now, as, as Andrew mentioned, there's, there's uh, parameters we can analyze that, look at, that affect the rate of, of cancer, uh, sorry, rate of evolution, and we predict that those would predict the rate of progression to malignancy. Um, so those, those parameters are the mutation rate, the population size, the generation time, and these all go into the generation of those variation that Andrew was talking about. And then the rate of clonal expansion is how we'd say it in cancer, or the strength of natural selection, which is the other side that, that Andrew was talking about. And since most tumors take decades to develop from the very first hit to when you feel sick or die, 20 to 50 years often in most cancers, if we could change that rate by just a factor of two, you would not die of cancer. You'd die of something else. So this is, again, a huge opportunity. So we've gone out after that with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs, like aspirin. Now this is a recent, uh, this panel on the left, um, panel on the left is a recent meta-analysis across all cancers where they've done tests with randomized controlled trials of uh, non-steroidal, sorry, NSAIDs, and found that NSAIDs in general suppress cancer, prevent cancer, by about 20%. Um, it's much more effective typically in the GI cancers, colon, um, esophagus, uh, uh, stomach, and uh, this is from our cohort of Barrett's esophagus patients that, that uh, do progress on to esophageal cancer if they don't take the, the NSAIDs and much less frequently progress if they are taking NSAIDs. And the NSAIDs actually worked very well even in the patients that had very high risk uh, tumor, the pre-malignant tumors that had a lot of genetic uh, instability in them. That's what this lower uh, panel is showing. So we want to know, we, we hypothesize that NSAIDs are actually reducing the mutation rate within the tumor. And it turns out there's some uh, recent work in evolutionary biology that shows that if you take multiple time points from an evolving system, then you can actually measure the mutation rate in vivo. So people have done this in viruses mainly, and we translated it into measuring uh, these pre-malignant tumors where we're watching the patients to see if they go on to get esophageal cancer. Um, so we actually had four time points so we could measure the, uh, the, t the um, thanks measure the mutation rate on NSAIDs, and then we had this is an observational crossover trial, so we had patients that had changed their NSAID use while we were watching them, and we had two more time points when they were off NSAIDs. And these are the, uh, the estimated mutation rates uh, per genome per year, and you can see that in general, the, that on NSAIDs, they had an order of magnitude lower mutation rate than when they were off NSAIDs. We've also done an experiment showing that you can slow evolution, and Andrew actually uh, made some reference to this, and we, this is, we call this competitive interference. You can, if you have multiple selective pressures, theory predicts that those interfere with each other and slow down the response of the population to any one pressure. So we took yeast, which are commonly used to develop cancer drugs because they're eukaryotic cells. We applied either one selective pressure or three selective pressures over 500 generations, and at the end of that period, we asked, have the yeast that were under three selective pressures evolved less to any one of those single pressures compared to the population that only, was only under a single pressure. So this is the pressure here was limit, limitations in histidine. These yeast can't produce their own histidine. And the, uh, the, uh, what this shows is that the, the yeast selected under one pressure were much more fit than the yeast selected under all pressures over here. And this is a summary of all the three different pressures. And the pink shows high fitness when yeast were uh, selected under one pressure. And this last column, two columns here, are selected under all pressures where they had much less fitness. So we were able to experimentally show that we can slow evolution. And it actually doesn't matter what pressures you put on the population. So these can be non-toxic selective pressures. It could be changes in diet. It could be changes in any kinds of exposures. And we think this is a possible mechanism for slowing progression to cancer just by sort of messing with the, the population, pushing it around with some you know, high broccoli diet or whatever it is. So given that there's somatic evolution and given that this is accepted, uh, accepted theory in cancer, the, the pushback I do get is, well, what should we do differently? And I think there's a lot of things we can do differently, and I've hinted at them already or discussed some of them. First of all, we should be focusing on understanding therapeutic resistance so that we can test for the presence of a resistant cells before we apply a drug, choose drugs to where we, there doesn't seem to be resistant cells in the tumor. We should be looking at how to prevent uh, the evolution of resistant cells in the tumors, and this, again, connects directly with Andrew's talk. And then we should be understanding the mechanism of that resistance so we can treat it and target it specifically. In cancer prevention, we've, uh, we've done some simulations showing that you, if you select for the benign state, you may be able to slow down progression to malignancy. Um, and I've shown you an example of, 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 uh, of an experiment showing how we could slow evolution. There's been very little use of phylogenetics as one of the most powerful tools in evolutionary biology. And if we had good phylogenetic measures of, of tumors, we could, as I showed you, measure the mutation rate. We can figure out the order of events that led to a, to a cancer, which may show you some bottlenecks for targeting. Uh, 
the cancer prevention. We could figure out the time, estimate the time of inter initiation of the tumor, so that gives you the window over which you could do cancer prevention. Um, and one thing we have done that I haven't had time to show you is that if you profile the diversity within the population, it actually is predictive of who's going to go on to get cancer and also who's going to die regardless of what treatment you use. The final, most provocative thing, I think, is to, is to come back to the way that we develop these drugs. We argue that you should be developing drugs that prolong life. And that's different from curing cancer, right? Currently, we've got these blinders on. Let's kill every last cancer cell. And as Andrew showed you, that's the fastest way to select for resistance. Can, and so this is my question for, at the end of my talk. Can we keep patients alive longer by not killing cancer cells? And, I'll, and I would point to tamoxifen as an example of this. Tamoxifen doesn't kill breast cancer cells. It just stops them from dividing. So all those sensitive cells remain in the population. They take up resources, they, and they... The fitness differential between the sensitive and resistant uh, variants um, is reduced, and so it takes a, about 10 years to get resistance to tamoxifen, whereas it takes on an order of months for a, a cytotoxic drug that's killing the cells. Um, but there's other ways of trying to prolong life that we should be exploring that don't involve necessarily targeting ca killing cancer cells. So Athena Actipis and Aurora Nadelko and I started the, the Center for Evolution and Cancer that, that Randy mentioned. And our goal here is to bring together, for the first time, to bring together this community of researchers working on the intersection of evolution and cancer to really try to build critical mass. So we held our first conference last year. Um, we'll be holding the next, next one next year every two years. Uh, we're starting monthly webinars uh, in the fall. We're hosting evolutionary data so that when you go through the painstaking effort to actually collect multiple samples from the same tumor and possibly over time, then all the other evolutionary biologists and statisticians and bioinformaticians can come in and develop their own methods for, under, for analyzing that um, and hopefully making progress in understanding and controlling the disease. So we're trying to bring more evolutionary biologists into cancer. I think it's a crying shame that if evolution is the center of cancer, ev cancer biologists ought to be evolutionary biologists, but we have just have so few of them at the moment, we really need help. Um, and we also are, are providing ev evolutionary education for cancer researchers that, that haven't uh, studied evolution and uh, want to, to sort of get, uh, get, bring those tools into their work. So finally, I wanted to acknowledge the support. Uh, we've been generously funded mostly by the NIH as well as some um, uh, foundations. Um, the work that I showed you on NSAIDs was done by my student, Ruman Kasadina, but just earned his PhD. He's now at Hopkins. Um, and uh, Lauren Merlo here uh, is the postdoc that did the yeast experiment, and the, all the Barrett's esophagus work is led by Brian Reed and, and Tom Vaughn. Um, and we have uh, also collaborated with Mary Cooner, who's uh, uh, a phylogeneticist. And uh, you'll see uh, Athena's up next, and a lot of this work and ideas were developed in, in collaboration with her. Thank you. <laughs>